What's good, everybody? This episode of the podcast is sponsored by DistroKid. They are the go-to for digital music distribution and the easiest way for musicians to get your music onto Spotify, iTunes, Amazon, TikTok, YouTube, and more. They offer unlimited uploads, and artists keep 100% of their earnings in stores 10 to 20 times faster than any other distributor. Fastest payouts. They help out with automatic splits, cover song clearance, and all kinds of other amazing tools and templates to help you get the most visibility for your releases. I dig this company and appreciate their business model that offers more features than any other distributor at the most affordable price possible for solo musicians, bands, DJs, studio artists, and any other creators that are producing music in their home, and they also offer label services as well. They've got three different tiers to offer creators that start as low as $22.99 a year. That's just $1.92 a month, and even their top tier is just $7.50 per month. And the best part about DistroKid sponsoring the podcast is that they are offering Dan Cable Presents listeners and viewers 30% off your first year membership with DistroKid, making their already affordable prices even cheaper for you. Check out the link in the episode notes. I will also put it in my Instagram bio in the link tree. That link will give you 30% off that first year of service. Super stoked to have DistroKid sponsoring the podcast and cannot thank them enough for their longtime support of this thing. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by Puff Coffee. Puff is one of my favorite coffee shops in Portland, Oregon. They've got a location off 28th and Stark in Southeast. Their coffee is delicious and everyone that works there is always super friendly. I had the pleasure of staying in their neighborhood for a month or so and it was just a real treat to have this as my neighborhood coffee shop for a bit. And now I find myself going out of my way to get over there and get some coffee. Puff Coffee was started by the founder of Stumptown Coffee, and they are making small batch coffee roasted daily here in Portland. Their mission to find, roast, and deliver the most delicious coffees anywhere. Their small batch process means that they get to keep things interesting with experimental blends and single origin gems while always keeping the classics on deck. They've got a variety of beans to choose from, and if you're not in the Portland area, you can order their small batch coffee straight to your home through their website, and you can use the coupon code DANCABLE, all one word, for 20% off a coffee subscription. Links for Puff Coffee will be in the episode notes. Big thanks to Puff for supporting the show and for their amazing small batch coffee. Now let's get into the episode. What is happening, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Dan Cable Presents Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the program once again. If this is your first time listening, thanks for checking out the show. You can find fresh episodes coming at you every Tuesday. And if you want to help support this thing in a free way, you can do so by clicking subscribe on iTunes, clicking write a review, giving the podcast five stars if you feel like it is deserving of so, and that will help propel this thing into the tops of those iTunes charts, giving it more visibility on the national and international levels, helping strangers find the podcast and just a great way to contribute to the growth and sustainability of this thing. If you're not listening on Apple, just hit like, follow, subscribe wherever you are listening from. If you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe there. Tell a friend about the podcast. Check out the monthly playlist that I've been dropping on Spotify every first of the month. 40 tracks every month pretty spread out genre wise and uh, just kind of a snapshot of what i'm listening to throughout the month and some things that are making it into my dj sets hope everyone is doing well super pumped to get into this episode episode 414 with portland based musician teacher engineer and overall great dude mike gamble is on the podcast i met mike through past guests of the podcast and some homies like uh, ryan oxford todd marston and i've just always enjoyed all of my interactions that i've had with mike thus far the first time we met he had been following my tuna sandwich videos and uh just chatted me up about tunas 
which I love. And uh, he's been on tour on the East Coast as of late, and he's been keeping me updated about the tuna sandwiches he's been enjoying out there in uh, New York and elsewhere on the road. And uh, also, if you if you tuned into last week's episode with Machado Machiga, another incredible musician from Portland, Oregon, who uh, is in a band with Mike called Tuo, uh, Machado spoke about what a big impact Mike has had on him since they started playing together. And I had already been wanting to have Mike on the show. And uh, Machado and I decided at the end of that episode, after we had our chat, that uh it would just be really great if we could get Mike to be the follow-up episode to Machado. So um, we did it. We made it happen. Mike and I recorded this conversation maybe two or three weeks ago. And uh, I just love this dude. And I'm glad we got some time on the mics together and uh, that we were able to uh, just have a hang and for uh, me to get to know him further He's uh, just a, such a sweet and welcoming dude and an incredible guitar player and just someone I have a lot of respect for. Just anytime I bring up Mike to anyone, uh, they often just gush about what a great person he is. And it was just really interesting to hear about his approach to making music and teaching and just to hear some different pieces of his journey. I know he's uh, he's just had so many experiences of uh playing music all over and uh it was great to find out where he's at with things now and his philosophies around music and and creating music and how those things have evolved over time and uh also for you folks viewing on the youtubes i have figured out a better mic placement situation for future guests that are a little taller so that the mic is just not in their face. I know you're going to be in the comments. You're going to be like, why did he allow that microphone to just be in this dude's face just right across it at times? And I'm sorry, okay? I, uh, I'm i still learning. I'm still learning things about this video setup. I'm learning about how these how these mic arms work. And it turns out I'm just an idiot. And I realize it could elevate in a certain way. So I think for the future, we're going to have a better solution for those things. And we're not going to have microphones just to cross people's faces. Okay? I got it. I got it figured out. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's going to be great in the future. Uh, and with all that, we are going to get into this thing. All the links for Mike Gamble will be in the episode notes. This dude is always playing around town. So tap in with him and uh, and see where he's playing next in the uh, in the Portland area. And this is episode 414 with Mike Gamble. And we're going to kick off this episode with a track from his most recent album, which is uh, the collaboration with Machado Machiga called Tuo. And uh, this one is called Most Wanted. Now let's do the damn to have you on the mics yeah Uh, man um, thanks for asking me yeah it's uh i've been going through your catalog of music quite a bit and i've gotten to see you play music a couple times Mm -hmm. and uh just really appreciate your approach to playing you know and just how uh experimental it is and and just uh i don't know it i'm always kind of like blown away by people like you that that play music like that and mm-hmm, just like mm-hmm. ex, um are usually exploring something it seems like every time you you pick up the instrument indeed um indeed i i, I in a lot of ways i feel like it's a impetus for me to go to every gig is that it's going to be something different whether it's like a a funny thing that's happening in the audience yeah that might switch uh the tempo of the song or like you know 
something that the bandmate does that's different, a count off, like, you know, a wink from somebody in the audience. Who who knows? It's every every time performing is different. And I really um have come to the place where trying to respect that more and more, especially post pandemic more or less. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah. Yeah, I also feel like when I'm listening to your music, I um I often can like fall into this meditation like really unintentionally oh, you cool. know it just like <laughs> kind of happens listening to the music it's uh like i feel like if if you give it the space to you it will very much like take you somewhere mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i feel like it's this thing that like allows for world building and maybe what i have like really come to appreciate about instrumental music in general mm -hmm. is that because it doesn't have that vocal narrative you mm -hmm. can really it really allows your mind to go wherever it's going to go which i don't think is always the case with all kinds of music no indeed and and you know especially with instrumental music that i've studied and i've loved in the past it can be sort of driven by either like a certain aesthetic or a certain genre and kind of being the the person I have been since my entire career, I've been wanting to kind of, you know, blur the lines and to, to more or less be able and be willing to um, go in between different genres, like at a flip, flip of a dime, or also, uh, you know, try to, try to not necessarily make a genre or make like a new t kind of time stamp in the whole lexicon of music. Um, but just be a part of the flow. Like yeah. I, I think any good artist, in my opinion, doesn't ever want to categorize themselves as a certain type of art mm. or a certain type of genre. I think that's for the writers and it's for the the critics and um, people to explain things in words, which I'm not against. But yeah. I think um, uh, you know it's it's a classic sort of express mode of expression especially from the jazz idiom of uh of artists just like miles or coltrane for example they would never even want to use the word jazz before it was even invented like it's the the history of that word is is so complex and complicated coming from the jasmine flower and um coming from new orleans and and just a whole mix of of the african diaspora with like music from all over the place like not just uh from africa from the caribbean from um uh like arcadia i mean it's yeah. wild <laughs> yeah do you find it very weird then when uh maybe the jazz purists try to put parameters on what jazz is yes and i have this conversation a lot um because uh I will say like certain publications and certain sort of uh, people that are involved in the jazz scene and the traditional jazz scene, I would say, definitely have parameters because they want to keep the tradition alive. Just like when you go to a classical concert and they still want to play um, the Bartok string quartets, even though it's pretty advanced, like that sort of idea of, of, of keeping like uh, composers that have passed away, that tradition alive. The same thing happens with more or less jazz because it, it happened more or less 100 years ago and um, it's still so young and so vibrant. That being said, a lot of people think that that genre specifically that is jazz that started in America um, is is like just this preserved thing that needs to never... Uh, like grow and, and move out of this, this sort of like ideological um, framework, which is never what any of the jazz musicians that were actually doing it actually thought about Yeah. Um, by any means. <laughs> yeah. It's, I don't know. I think it's bizarre when people do that with like anything, you know? Yeah. It's just not like, just jazz. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> just stifling like the evolution of something. Like. Sure. I mean, there's a respect, I think, you know, being, uh, being an artist and, and knowing like, you know, the recipes more or less and knowing like how a jazz standard would work and how those standards came from basically pop songs of the, of the, uh, the era. And also there's counterfacts, which, you know, 
are sort of like replications of those in their own little poetic way that Charlie Parker did and then Ornette Coleman did and um, now you know any young kid that's that's studying will do the same thing um, and you know I just like you know so many people in the music world will relate music to food in a way um, and thinking about like the dependent origination of so many great recipes and how certain ingredients were formulated with others and when you have something that's that seems like it's a it's a it's a bad combination yeah. of of certain recipes like it can be off-putting and the actual flavors and the actual ingredients um are sort of like mushed into this this uh this kind of like overall bland like unami meets uh, <laughs> whatever yeah <laughs> you know it's like actually yeah there's not restrictions necessarily, but there's boundaries and limits that that sort of come, I think, in both cooking and with music and, and art in general. Yeah, it's a little bit different with with <laughs> sports, but I'm a huge oh, yeah. hockey fan. And I just think about maybe the evolution of the rules and how that has made the game better and what people mm -hmm. are like resistant to maybe oh, yeah. initially. Mm -hmm. and maybe even myself sometimes where mm -hmm. I'm just like, I don't know if that's like where we need to go with the game, but then you like see how those rules impact the game over, you know, a couple years or mm -hmm. um, thinking about like baseball last year put into motion a pitch clock so that the game would move mm -hmm. along much quicker because they were just getting into so many of these games that were exceeding maybe like three hours and, and sure that maybe that's too long for maybe especially a new fan to want to invest that much time. And at first I was like, man, the, the, the game that the pitcher and the batter are playing though, without a time clock is so much fun. Like the mind game of it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't know if this is a good thing for this. And now that it's been in place for like a year and a half, it's like, Oh, it is kind of more enjoyable to watch this baseball game move at such a rapid speed where we're like, this game's over in two hours. <laughs> and you know, I think it's, it forces maybe a different type of creativity within sure. those pitchers and the way a batter has the amount of time. I agree. I, I feel like boundaries and, and limitations are one of the most important things to be an experimental artist of any of means. Um, and I had a great teacher who said some amazing things. Um, his name is Bob Moses. Um, he was the drummer that played on like, Pat Metheny's first album, Bright Side's Life with Jaco Pastorius. And since then has like played on a million albums, including his own, and uh now goes by Rock Alarm. Um he said a couple of things to me that just have always been ringing in my head. And one of those was, you have to learn to burn. And <laughs> what I think he meant was in the context of quote unquote jazz and improvised music like to learn the the form of something or learn like the traditional uh, language that that has sort of been arisen from various artists, you have to sort of go through the process of, of knowing what the ins and outs of that are in order to let it go on the, mo at, uh, on the spot and quote unquote play free jazz or experimental music. And that I feel like is something that's always in the back of my head. So as, as much as experimentation I can go for and say like, oh yeah, I have this great idea where I'm going to merge like, like, f like these cassette tapes with this reel to reel and then run it through a space echo. And I'm like, yeah, actually that has been done <laughs> in certain many <laughs> yeah. ways. And also it hasn't been done by me. So the personality and sort of like the the uh, impetus of each individual artist that's having respect for how it's been done, but also a look to the future um, is an important kind of mantra that I keep with myself. Yeah, because you have not only skills as a player yourself, but also as an engineer and, mm -hmm. and dive into the technical side, mm -hmm. do you feel like you're ex that just really allows you to experiment even more well yeah i mean the studio is a musician within itself um and it is uh you know especially with the advent of how fast uh speaking about the the sports and the timing of how fast a studio session can go um 
and how quickly you can sort of muster up like plugins or effects that have been researched forever and and sort of codified into just you know a single single like twenty dollar plugin. You know you can learn the history of those things and then actually when you get a chance to be around the real actual artifacts of the audio world whether it's like an expensive german microphone or or some rare american guitar that you find at a thrift store um you can utilize those things in a way that that um gives you a different sense as an artist and your final product which essentially that's what we all do as artists we finish things and uh you can hem and haul and be precious about certain like editing or this or that, especially in the digital world where yeah. you can do a hundred takes in, in like, you know, two hours and then lose steam and this or that, and then edit it all together. But once again, in a time-based formation, um, you're wasting time when you're uh, doing certain things in that area, but you're also exploring too, and you're, you're figuring out the ways that you want to work in the future. So I've done so many albums myself where, I've hemmed and hauled and edited and, and wasted too much time, put it out and then listen it to later. And I was like, actually some of the first mixes were better. So why did I even waste the time to so like yeah. a couple albums I did during the pandemic where I gave myself a very specific structure where I had cassette tapes and I was like, okay, I have a half hour in between this private zoom lesson and that private zoom lesson. So I'm give myself five minutes to write some uh, ideas or like whatever uh, sort of like harmonic or rhythmic material I have. And then I'm going to give myself another five minutes to record the first track and another for the second. And then a third to maybe dub those tracks out and a fourth to like, you know, do whatever you know I was thinking at the moment. Yeah. And then another 10 minutes to just dupe it onto the to the digital world so you know there's a lot of ways i think as an audio engineer slash musician that you can really sort of um create a new instrument within the process of itself just like any greats like jay dilla to um oh my gosh the the list goes on mf doom like yeah. you, you name it um so many great artists have been doing it square pusher yeah uh, I could go on forever. <laughs> but placing like time parameters yeah. is some, sometimes the thing that keeps you out of your own way. Exactly. Time parameters and also um, it's like a mix of time parameters and openness to if for some reason you need to work on something five million more times as you ever expected, like be ready to do that yeah. until it's something that you feel comfortable with presenting to the world. Was guitar your first instrument? Um yeah, the first instrument I would say that I that I just started to study with. Um, my mom is a pianist, and I kind of like was al already like as a kid listening and singing along the tracks and sort of like air drumming or whatever I was doing. And then it was a moment where my mom's like, "Okay, maybe you can start taking some piano lessons." I'm like, "I don't want to do what my mom does." <laughs> so my uncle had the idea to get me a guitar in fourth grade, and and I'm a lefty, so. I immediately picked it up like a lefty did. And the first song I wrote with, with my family was like on New Year's Eve. Um, we just wrote some weird New Year's Eve song. And, and then uh, I had my first guitar lesson um, with a lovely old older lady in the middle of Ohio. And she was like, oh, you're going to have to flip, flip this around because I can't teach you left-handed. I was like, okay, cool. And then I just did it, and oh, that dang. was it. So you just learned. <laughs> it wasn't my my decision to play as a lefty playing right-handed guitar. So, Do you feel like that was a, a big barrier initially uh, to initially, have to play? I don't think I, I knew anything. And, okay. uh, and I think it was a barrier in certain ways because, you know, in general, the left hand is sort of like, quicker at doing things and the right hand is a little more clumsy but I think in general it was a uh it was a great decision because I feel like I'm more flexible with my left hand mm. in general and um I don't know some of my favorite guitarists like confess the same thing like I think Mary Halverson and Nels Klein and Ava Mendoza yeah. are all left-handed guitars playing right-handed guitars 
<laughs> it must must impact your style in some way. I think so. Yeah. Um, I mean, every time I try to play left-handed guitar, I I feel like I'm such a beginner, and it's great as a teacher. You're like, this is what it actually feels like when your fingers don't know yeah. where to go <laughs> or don't know how much pressure to use. Yeah. 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 Did you uh, just kind of immerse yourself in it? Like once you picked it up, though, like did it hit you in yeah. a in a really heavy way where that's what you kind of wanted to do with most of your free time? Yeah, I, I, when I first really got into it, like I, I, I just remember, yeah, writing a song with my pops and then kind of just exploring it and writing like the simplest songs and taking lessons and and I did have a moment where. I think it was, you know, classic, like, I guess they call it tween era, right? <laughs> As in the in-between area or tweener, tweens? Yeah. Like 12? 12. We're, we're like talking the 12 about like 11, 12? Yes. <laughs> so around that zone, like, uh, I was doing a lot of guitar and I did all these ridiculous things. Like, I was in this this gifted program called, um, I think it was just called uh, Enrichment. And, you know... We played Oregon Trail, like video game, and then we had like projects that we did. So I did like a guitar project for my my fifth grade like thesis, more or less. Nice. And it was like a ridiculous, like, you know, my parents finally got a VHS. So I like made this video of me as like as a professor guitarist, as a judge, as like a skateboarder, (laughs) as like a rocker. It was so ridiculous. And I Hope nobody ever watches this, but we'll if be they cutting do, to that now if you're um, watching on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just clips of that. Oh my That'd gosh, be incredible, dude! But um, but so th- when that happened, I was I was like, cool, I did this, and you know, the adolescent slash tween thing happened, and you know, I was like building forts with my friends in Ohio, and like, you know, doing bad things as you would imagine, uh, being an adolescent, and there was this one specific moment where this kid came over. Who was like the kind of the kid that was like, I don't know, doing all the, the really bad things like throwing cats in the air and making yeah. skateboard ramps and dipping. And I was just like, OK, what's your deal, guy? He like came <laughs> over and he showed me how to play Thunderstruck by ACDC. And of course, like showed me how to play Inner Salmon or something like that. And that was the moment where I was like, OK, cool. This guy is doing this. He's showing me how to finger tap and and. I've been in this zone of being like a kid and wanting to quit music. And I was like, you know what? I do want to do this, but I don't want to be this guy. So I like, I I went from essentially playing in the woods and doing all the stuff, making whatever paper airplanes, origami, whatever you do with your friends and like just hunkering down, listening to the radio, making tapes of songs and learning everything by ear and then eventually I started taking guitar lessons again. But I, I did a lot of sort of training where I did a lot of stuff by ear. So. Yeah. So before uh, that degenerate kid degenerate, <laughs> showed yeah. you how to play ACDC and Metallica, <laughs> were you, was your all of your guitar training even up into that like pretty rigid and you were just like um, learning scales and you weren't like... Yeah, I would say like the first teacher was really rigid and I actually quit because I was so bored. Not the um, type of teacher that was like, hey, what do you want to learn? What song do you no, want to learn No, it was like, hey, today? like here's like this cheesy guitar book, you know, by Alfred or I forget, maybe it was uh, another one. But, you know, the coolest thing that I think she showed me was like wipe out or something. And then I was like, cool, peace this out. And then I got another teacher who was like your classic sort of like ponytailed classical guy and then he was like well maybe for the recital you can learn stairway to heaven i was like that sounds great i was like i didn't even know about led zeppelin he played it for me i was like all right cool i'm digging this and in fifth grade so i learned stairway to heaven and i played it at the recital in the middle of this like small town in ohio at this church and and i remember the real moment this is prior to the degenerate moment was i played it by memory stairway to heaven and then the last chord like i went to play like an a minor chord and i played like some wild like a minor nine chord open strings and i didn't expect that i didn't realize it was going to happen yeah and it just happened and that moment i'll never forget because sort of this like almost like this window just opened is like you can just find new things you don't have to be restrictive to 
you know, this, this piece that was written forever. And the funniest thing, of course, like I left and, you know, I'm just like, cool, done with that next gig in, in my mind. And this lady comes up, comes up to me. She's like, ah, you know, I really appreciate your guitar playing. I, d- I did not know that hymn, Stairway to Heaven, that you played. <laughs> that hymn. And I was like, oh, it's a song by Led Zeppelin. <laughs> and, and they're like, thank you. And yeah, I don't know. That's a stupid little This is like but, small town Ohio? Yeah, definitely. Um, so did you know, uh, other than, you know, maybe your parents who played music did you know any other like many other musicians or like did you see a lot of people yeah. that that you saw that being like a tangible thing <laughs> that you could do for you know throughout your life yeah i um i would drive to philadelphia with my pops and he would and my mom and my brother and we listened to like oldies on the way when we got to philadelphia and i had a couple cousins that played guitar but in Ohio, there were like a couple of friends. Uh, one of my friends is a bass player in the first band that I started called Paradox, which is ridiculous. Um, he and I, when we sort of got to know each other around sixth grade or so, when I was like, okay, I'm done with being a degenerate. Can we just listen to music? We like both listened to like Frank Zappa and like got into like jazz for the first time like yeah. eric dolphy out to lunch and so you got kinda, into that that like experimental stuff pretty yeah early on or things that like explored outside of maybe pop sensibilities really yeah early. because at that at that time like you know of course i got into grunge and i learned all that stuff and when i started the band paradox we like would do house shows all over <laughs> ohio and i'd sing these songs and um, and then I would like save up to get a four track and I like made all these tracks where it could be anything from like, you know, a Beatles song to like a grunge song to like a seventies or nineties, you know, cont- or I seventies or eighties song. And I would just sell the, these like karaoke tapes in middle school yeah, and try to try to get the hustle going early. <laughs> and, um, so eventually like, you know, seeing live music really changed, I would say, when I was of age. Um, after, of course, I went to a Metallica show with my dad, smelled weed for the first time, and, and uh, that was funny. I was like, what's the smell, Dad? <laughs> um, uh, and then it was like the grunge era happened, and then, of course, you know, super, I would say the closest thing to an idol of mine was, was Kurt Cobain and Nirvana in general, and that you know, the person passed away and I was right simultaneously where I was like getting into like kind of like cheesy virtuosic guitarists like Joe Satriani and Steve Vai and like, you know, nerdy virtuoso guitar age, if that's actually happened. Um, and then, of course, like by the time I got to high school, um, I had to make the decision where like, do I want to be a football player or like in marching band. And my dad, who grew up playing f- like football in Philly, was like, it's not the same. Like it's it's kind of like brutal and there's steroids and you're gonna get hurt. It's probably gonna be better for you to do music instead. So of course, like I picked up the freaking sousaphone and the was who? in the sousaphone. <laughs> I don't even know what that yeah, is, it's, Mike. it's a tuba that's that you put over your shoulders that it's in marching oh, okay. band. All right, I and got you. just like, yeah, got into to that stuff and um, and then uh, got into what's called the Columbus Youth Jazz Orchestra and started to really get down with like learning all the, the real great big band stuff through this guy, Todd Stoll, who works with Wynton Marcellus now at the um, uh, Lincoln Center situation. But he would like get like, you know, in touch with Sue Mingus and get like the original Mingus charts, get the original like duke ellington charts and okay. it was really legit and that that was really what sort of paved me to getting into to quote-unquote jazz and classical music because i played cello too and the reason why i played cello because i was really obsessed with nirvana plugged of course oh, okay Lori goldston now coincidentally i'm you know i toured with this band earth for a while and now i'm putting out a duo record with Lori and yeah I don't know. It's like a small world situation. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I told her, it took me like five weeks on tour to have the guts enough to be like, Hey, by the way, 
you, you were really influential for me as a kid. <laughs> and, you know, and I think that's cool when you kind of like wait that out <laughs> yeah. to like establish a relationship with somebody, especially if you are going to be like touring with them before yeah. you just like, I'm such a big fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or like, I feel like it's Chris Farley situation where you're like, yo, you remember when that one time when you played that one show and like I was watching it on MTV and yeah. you know, I didn't want to go there. I just yeah. like a lot of relationships. I don't want to like establish myself as somebody who I'm not in the presence. Like, you know, I just want to meet people because people are people. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. It's hard yeah. to grasp that too <laughs> yeah. sometimes before yeah. you actually establish a relationship <laughs> with somebody. You're just like when you, I think especially when you are only listening to something afar, like from afar, mm -hmm. like have that relationship from afar, you like can easily put a bunch of things on someone before you actually get to know who they are as a person. Oh yeah. And it's not just in the music world for sure. Like, I mean, in pop culture world, of course, but I would say just even in, in your local town, you know, it's like you see, you know, like somebody's Instagram story for a yeah. second and you're like have this preconceived notion of who they are and also who they represent themselves on the social media platform. But it's not who they really are. Yeah. <laughs> regardless. Like, what if people think Tuna Boy is just like a real cool guy? And he's just, it's just like, he's not. He's not. <laughs> I don't know. In my book, it's it's damn cool. And every time I eat a tuna sandwich, I think about you at this point. Um, including last night. I, uh, my friends had, had us over. And, and uh, yeah, there was just a heaping mound of tuna salad. And I was like, what? why isn't Dan invited? I and, want to know who's th having dinner parties <laughs> where there's like a heaping amount of, of tuna salad. Like that sounds yeah. like a good well, yeah. dinner party. I, I mean, it might be like a situation where they're like, they want to like work it up a little bit before they even like approach Tuna Boy with <laughs> coming. Because, you know, let's face it, you know, like we we're saying, like you're, you're, uh, I guess you're, I, I, I've lost the words right now, but your blah, blah, blah procedure, blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. You're, well, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't want me coming in and just like criticizing the tuna either. <laughs> okay. Just like how shady, like this is, this isn't good. This is a house party. How could you? <laughs> How could you put that much mayonnaise? Yeah. I mean, if you're going to have tuna salad here, it better be pretty banging. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing is, this might be a little bit on the grotesque tip, but hey, it's real. My grandfather in Philly, for some reason, he was obsessed with tuna salad, but he would freeze tuna salad. I think I might have told Dude, you, you this, told and I'm me sorry this? if I no, didn't. I love that you're telling me this on the mics now because you told me this story at Tree Fort when we were hanging out, <laughs> and I was just blown away by this man who froze his tuna salad mixture. Yes. Still grosses me out. He still told me to drink tomato juice. It could put like hair in my chest, which obviously it did. I don't know if that was why. But that was yeah. that was old John Gamble in Glen Olden, Pennsylvania. I just want to know, like, does it work? Can you just defrost <sighs> tuna like it's soup? This is the issue. This like, is the issue. I one time that I never like did. Dude, I never took a bite. I one, was like, yeah, you're, one. You're dipping like saltine crackers into this defrosted tuna salad. It's got to be I'm pretty liquidy it. at the bottom. <sighs> Mike, one time, my buddy and I, we went on this camping trip with a bunch of people, and okay. it was like one of those situations where you're staying at a house with 10 other people, and so what we decided was that mostly we would all eat on our own. Okay. So my buddy that I was like kind of paired up with for that weekend, um, we decided that what we would do is that we would just make a giant batch of tuna salad that would last us but you just can't do that like three days in this tuna salad is mm. just a, a liquidy mess at the bottom yes yeah i mean it definitely is is constituted by a lot of liquid already yeah so when when things deteriorate yeah of course the the physics behind it can be really a problem and then the food safety it's gotta happen on it. the daily yes. gotta make that tuna make sure on the daily um <laughs> How do you think it was like pretty important when you got exposed to the jazz world, even in high school, that you like stepped away and and touched these other instruments and like yeah? Do you think that had a big impact on like the way that you would come back to the guitar? Absolutely, because um, 
when I was doing like, for example, playing cello in the orchestra, like I, I just, you just hear things differently because you're within a section and you have to be in tune with other cellists and you have to be aware what the concert master is like, uh, or the concert mistress is, is doing like in terms of like, like specifically cueing stuff and then what the director is doing. So, you know, there's, there's moments where it's like, how can I bridge this into playing improvised music? Like on either like a compositional standpoint or an arrangement standpoint, or just like, you know, traditional sort of like roles of, of being in a quote unquote orchestra. Uh, that is also translated into like the symphonic orchestra that I was playing concert tuba in. And then also the marching band too, which is totally insane. We were like this band that played, I kid you not, like Stravinsky. We played Gustav Holst. We played like Hang On Sloopy, all like the classic, like, you know, pep band stuff. But then we were like, yeah, doing like, you know, bars of five and seven, like all the nerdy math rock ask things but on the marching band field where I was like in charge of 15 sousaphone players not to trip on mud and to like <laughs> follow their their real specific coordinates so in a lot of ways yeah it's all it's all sort of funneled into my practice in some some sort of way I mean I've definitely had some post-traumatic marching band situations <laughs> and nightmares in my head because the the director always had this hilarious saying which was like printed on like this wood slab that was like on top of like a hundred foot telephone pole where he was there with his team and like old school, like intercom situations. And it said, take it back, do it again. <laughs> Same thing, comma, go. And I think maybe explanation mark or something. So <laughs> that was the thing is like, we, if we miss our mark, if we're like, like five, inches away from where we're supposed to be he would have people pull us so if you're away you had to like take four laps around the the football field and then he'd be like take it back do it again same thing go it was like some computer like pre-ai command it's that hard-ass coach <laughs> mentality definitely, to it definitely. it was like oh it's like the um the whiplash movie oh yeah oh yeah where the dude is just like a drill sergeant i couldn't i couldn't watch it for freaking 10 years i finally did yeah i feel like musicians really have that response to that movie yeah like especially the ones that maybe have gone through well yeah some really intense training yeah it's like i mean it's terrible to kind of say in a way but it's like kind of being like a veteran of sorts like you you know if you go through any sort of toxic situation that's you know i will say toxic masculinity for the most part like embedded into like some sense of like weird like capitalism or weird sort of uh i don't know like uh mind games of, yeah. of all sorts like <laughs> yeah, just... all compiled into one like yeah it's like being in uh a sort of conglomerate that you're not really aware of until you step away from it and then you see like the hollywood version of of where they just like like just infest like all of their actors or directors, or producers and into all these like tropes that are created naturally, but then, you know, uh, you know, sensationalized like Hollywood does. Like, yeah, it's tough to even press play on <laughs> Netflix or whatever. Before I continue, <laughs> would using. that player care to identify himself? No. Okay, maybe a bug flew in my ear. One fifteen. Five, six, and. No? My ears are fine. We definitely have an out of tune player. Whoever it is, this is your last chance. And there it went. Now, either you are deliberately playing out of tune and sabotaging my band, or you don't know you're out of tune, which I'm afraid is even worse. Tell me it's not you, Elmer Fudd. Do you think you're out of tune? What are you, there's no fucking Mars bar down there. What are you looking at? Look up here, look at me. Do you think you're out of tune? Yes. Then why the fuck didn't 
you say so? So, while playing with like these ensembles in high school, mm -hmm. you were also from an early age pretty drawn into composing, writing your own music mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with this like Paradox band. And yeah, Paradox did yeah a lot of original music and then a lot of covers as well were you always like kind of pretty comfortable with kind of taking the lead in these things as yeah. far as like being the person writing the music or or singing the music yeah i sing in those bands um and my f my bandmates would definitely contribute certain things like i wasn't like it has to be this way i wasn't like zap ahead in that way yeah and that controlling um but, uh, you know, there also had to be somebody who had to, like, get things done and book the shows and stuff like that. So I was always comfortable doing that. And then, of course, when Paradox turned into... We had a joke name for my, my brother's graduation called Chubb, which ter it's terrible because, like, my uncle found out. And he's like, do you know what that really is to my mom? It's and, a great band name. And, <laughs> yeah, these is. days it would really slap, I guess. But Dude, I want a um, punk band. Or a hardcore <laughs> band named Chubb so bad. It might just have to come back and I'll I'll play bass in it or something okay. if you're down with it. Um and then of course like change the name again in high school to um to Spork. Spork. And, yeah, Spork yeah. went pretty far. We went all the way to the Battle of the Bands in, in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Where we lost the final round to a band called Death God. Damn. And um, that's at the same club that Dimebag Daryl was sadly R.I.P. taken away. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. Uh, the Aro Sevilla was nuts. Death God? Death God won. That feels like a <laughs> proper band to lose to. Yeah. At least you could say, like, oh, yeah, we lost to Death God. Of course you did. Yeah. <laughs> They're Death did. God. But, but that band, as far as, like, you're talking about control of this or that, I, I definitely learned... In a lot of ways, like when I when I ended up getting accepted into the New England Conservatory and started to work in like traditional band situations, like in the jazz world or whatever. Yeah. When I moved to New York with um, a trio that I was living with and doing all these society gigs like wine stuff and, you know, whatever you want to say around Boston to make money, um, I intentionally wanted to move to New York with this trio and have the band mentality, have like something where I started from, which is basically listening to bands, listening to not the Mike Gamble trio. Yeah. You know, and I never wanted to do that. It's like my post collegiate thing. I was like, I, I don't want to just spend a lot of money hiring my teachers to like do these gigs. I'll never see them. I want to develop a band sound. So that's when I started this band called the in-betweens, which um, still is together. And we're going to do a tour next week. In New oh, York. hell yeah. Yeah. Um, what was, uh, the switch like for you or like, what do you, was there like a particular moment or time period that really made you feel like you wanted to go to somewhere like the New England Conservatory and, and pursue this, uh, academically in some mm -hmm, ways? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, at that time, you know, I will say like jazz and academia has been through some really tough times because, a, it's never really been in academia in the first place, and it's not something that that is necessarily taught in an academic um, sort of mindset. Um, it's it's a lot of like experience. It's a lot of ear training, learn on the bandstand, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, compose by studying, you know, the greats and and listening to the greats and seeing them do it live. And when it went into academia, it went through its all, all those issues. And the conservatory that I went to was actually the first school that offered a jazz program, which is cool in a way. Um, and some of my favorite artists graduated from there, like Cecil Taylor, amazing avant-garde pianist. Um, this guy, John Medeski, went there. Um, and the list goes on and on with, with amazing poets, inc including like Jamie Branch, who passed away, um, R.I.P., you know, a couple of years ago, there was a great sort of uh, sense of um, of forward thinking instructors there. And that's what really drew me to wanting to go there. Like I, I was studying with this person in Columbus named Stan Smith, who's a great guitarist. And he recommended me um, a couple books. This one uh, by this guy, Mick Goodrick, who is in Boston, who was teaching at the school. 
and another one by Gene Bernsini, who was also teaching at the school. And he came to actually do a workshop. And, uh, you know, I was a super nerd and read all the books and like studied them and, and, you know, auditioned for all these places in Ohio and then took audition in New England, which actually, strange enough, I was born in Providence. So I felt like a, you know, original New England, area, <laughs> you know, you got some roots there. Yeah. You got, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to go into my terrible post, um, Goodwill hunting, uh, you know, accent. Oh, I wish you would. Mike. <laughs> maybe, maybe at some point, but, um, but, uh, so when I got accepted into the conservatory with a nice scholarship, I was like, Holy moly. You know, I didn't, didn't expect that all these like, you know, great writers and people that, uh, I've always looked up to listening to the recordings. I actually be physically in the room with. Oh, wow. And that, well, I will say is like the big, takeaway from going to school for music is you're in the room with these people that have been in the room with other people and yeah. shared like the most extreme circumstances of like touring or like putting on a record and this or that so it's like having that experience was really what I was looking for and I took school really seriously like I wasn't I wasn't like slacker kind of situation I was like if I'm going to pay for this which I still am to this day hopefully <laughs> if 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 maybe I'll get it wiped away by the current like situation, I'm hoping. For, I'm hoping. So. I'm hoping too. Yeah. Um, but but it wasn't something you were doing like begrudgedly in any way, like no, or like that stressed you out in a way where no, you were. It, it was just so exciting to me to to go from the middle of Ohio and you know where I I will say like Columbus. I love Columbus in a lot of ways, but I do feel like it's the epicenter of genericity. It's a fact where they actually audition fast food restaurants in Columbus because it's so normcore in that way. Not like yeah. the fashion normcore that was popular. Yeah. A while ago, like actual normcore. And um, you know, like I grew up like listening to all like the major rock stations and, you know, would go and buy like anything from like in excess to like hello cool j but i didn't yeah. know about like niche hip-hop or or unless i like you know i had a girlfriend who was way into college music journal in high school so i like started to read that i was like oh there's other bands well, other cool. than the ones that are on the main like you know whatever now viacom like you know owned well, radio stations. yeah man well especially i would have i don't know i'm i'm not that much younger than you so mm -hmm. like i'm on the you know the internet came into play more in high school and even the version of the internet was not like insanely prominent so it was like mm -hmm. all based it's not like you had the internet to you know open your mind to all these different genres of music you truly like had to dig for it or you had to like know somebody yeah. that or like to put you on to some sort of publication that would you know, expose you to things that were outside of yeah. mainstream radio. And or you had to like do the research and go to used record stores in Columbus. Like I would, you know, cut a bunch of grass and do whatever I had to do in high yeah. school to save up money to go. There was like some really great record stores in Columbus, definitely. One of the worst names ever for a record store to used kids. Used was, kids records. Like, really? It's still there, I think. I'm like... They survived even with that name. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I do find it like pretty interesting with the the jazz world often maybe or like these programs where you also do get the opportunities to maybe play gigs with your professors. Like oh, yeah. they like invite you to come play their gigs. Yes. <laughs> and now being on the other side of that, where I am a professor now, yeah. not technically a professor because I don't have a doctorate, but more or less, um, I'm doing that. And, and I can see that sort of passing on the torch or like this sort of like, you know, respect for younger artists that are actually, you know, professionals already. Yeah. Even though they, they might have not done as many gigs as you, you know, have 20 or odd years on most of my students. But to, to reach them in a way where it's like there's a there's a communicative thing that's not like, oh, like I'm better than you or, you know, I'm more worth worthy than you because I've done all this. 
like that that is some whiplash yeah. situation yeah 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 like it's, it's actually like oh no i want to invite you to do this because i really enjoy what you're doing as an artist and i want to you know experience that with you and and help you in any way yes if they have questions yeah but you know to each their own in in this situation as to being an artist i think you know what do you i feel like i don't know one of the last times i saw you play was one of these uh these free jazz sets that you did at blue butler studios oh, with nice. machado uh -huh. and with todd sikafus maybe bass player yes yes mm -hmm. yeah hadn't seen todd play before wasn't familiar with him before mm -hmm. that gig but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i've seen machado play in some some other things over the years and uh i one of the things i like loved about that set is that often i if i was closing my eyes i wouldn't know that you were even playing a guitar like with yeah. the sounds that you're mm -hmm, able mm -hmm. to get out of the instrument when do you remember that kind of happening and like really going down that rabbit hole of experimentation of like what sounds you could get out of the instrument sure. like does that go back to even that zap like getting exposed to the zappa stuff or were there well, some other players that really yeah i mean i would say players and also experimenting with like different effects and different ways to sort of manipulate your sound um i mean there's there's a bunch of of guitars i listened to in in, in high school that i feel like started to get me on onto that tip like um when i was kind of like checking out alan holdsworth or checking out uh even like nels klein or like even like schofield like those kind of people um they had like small bits of effects like here and there that sort of like put them in in a different perspective like not just playing guitar it's like they're playing the effects as a part yeah. an extension like extension of the guitar like uh alternate th uh you know realms and realities of this or that and then by the time i got to college like hearing like the way that sun raw would just just totally like put a whole new perspective on anything from like one synthesizer to a whole orchestra or like how um like square pusher or apex twin would would you know take drum machines and tape machines and one really nerdy effect that they got to to make an entirely different sound, either from an electroacoustic standpoint or just as a different instrument. So um, what I more or less did was was kind of slowly just collect things and sort of bring it into, quote unquote, the arsenal and then learn it and then try to burn it. And in the fact where it's like, you know, oftentimes, you know, it's a very sort of typical thing that people will want to check out your effects board or like what do you, yeah what do you got you know dude what are you using <laughs> and that's always it's been a pet peeve of mine for ages to even like like you know show somebody what your recipe is but i've gotten more comfortable being like you know people are interested in what it is and you know here here it is you can check it out i don't yeah. i don't care i'm more of like a nihilist in that sense these days but what really does bother me, I will say, <laughs> is if people bring a load of gear with them, with a load of effects, and you can shut your eyes and you'd be like, actually, I can't even tell the difference that you're using one thing. That's a little bothersome for me. <laughs> so if someone's going to yeah. bring a bunch of stuff in, you want to be able to know, like, well, I want to, I want to just hear the yeah. difference. Yeah. You know, or like feel the difference. Yeah. Not necessarily see it. Yeah. You know, but um but that being said so so that did sort of like eventually get into my thing like i i was really traditional jazz when i went to school at first because i was nervous i was like i have to learn all this every charlie christian song and like every west montgomery solo and i studied with um still to this day like uh also an rip situation john abercrombie who's a great guitarist um and put out some of the greatest records i think of guitar trio stuff which i was also listening to in in college and in high school called gateway is, is a really great album but anyway so john ended up taking the teaching position from mick goodrick who's that other person that i mentioned and um hanging out with him i was like 
so nervous to study with him. And I remember he gave me a B the first semester. I was like, oh, I need to learn traditional jazz and like get into this whole thing. So like I ended up like studying with uh, some really like great jazz educators in that way, like Jerry Berganzi. And um, I studied composition with Bob Brookmeyer, who was great, played with everyone from like, Jimmy Jufri to Stan Getz and had his own big band and yada, yada, yada. Um, the big turnaround, I would say, to get back into the experimental and using different sounds out of the jazz guitar was going to see this group called The Fringe, which is in Boston. George Garzon, who I also studied with, a great saxophone player, and uh, a drummer, Bob Galati, who's also passed away, and um, John Lockwood. Yeah, so they played every month... I'm sorry, every week, every Monday at this place called the Lizard Lounge. So the whole thing would be like, Mondays we would just go check out George Gonzalez. And they would play basically free jazz in the sense where they would go in between maybe playing a standard in a new way yeah. to like completely free open music and, and do it with, with so much conviction and so much like interest. And also like was really cool because he would bring some students to like sit in and yada, yada, yada. So that was a moment where... As soon as I took his class, which is all about um, like using a different way of chromaticism, like that's different than like the second Viennese school with like Schoenberg and Alban Berg and all those those peeps and different than even like the Braxton school and the, uh, you know, school from Chicago. Like he had his whole way of like in, interpret, interpreting the chromatic scale and his way of uh uh, using triads and this or that. It was really cool. And that's what sort of opened me back into, oh, I can get back into like the more like, you know, electronic sounds. And, you know, it's also like when OK Computer came out and also like when, you know, I kind of got back into pop music um, because like it was kind of a terrible time, I would say from 94 to 98 for pop music in general. I mean, hip hop, <laughs> hip hop was great. And yeah, there was, of course, like indie rock bands that were awesome. But in general, it was just like, I cannot listen to, to some of that music. It wasn't for you. <laughs> it wasn't for me. Let's put it that way. Now these days I try to sit with everything and be like, all right, yeah, we can deal with this. But at the time I couldn't. Um, what is free jazz to you? And what is the experience that you get playing that, those that style of music, mm -hmm. those sets versus maybe something that has a little more structure, like composition to it. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Um, to me, what free jazz is, is a form of expression and it's a form of, of not limiting yourself to any particular thing that you've learned, um, and sticking to that. Um, rather, it's using the tools that are in your shed to be there with the audience or the recording tape or whatever. Um, and knowing that whatever you're doing at the moment has to be heard by somebody or someone either in the room or listening to it on headphones later. And also, um, you have to have a sense of respect for, the incredible individuals that have collectively produced this sub genre of sorts that is free jazz. So anything from, from pretty much, I think Ornette Coleman on, um, and that could be even Steve Lacey, not the current artist, Steve Lacey, but the saxophonist and clarinetist yeah. and, uh, composer Steve Lacey to, yeah, the, the Afrofuturists and to the, um, the, the sort of like English improv crew as well, um, from Derek Bailey and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And just knowing like that these people have done things and still to this day, there are new people finding new ways to, to contextualize what is free jazz. Um, and to be able to just, just at the moment kind of let it go and to be there to experience new things. Yeah. With collaborators or as a solo artist too. For sure. What with you, your alter ego or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know you like to like, you, you're recording very mm -hmm. often, mm -hmm. like kind mm -hmm. of like recording these 
pretty improvised sets. Absolutely. What do you like about that practice and it regularly happening? Well, I would say recording improvised music, um, it A, sort of puts a timestamp on it all, and it also B, gives you an opportunity to to work on the art of recording itself and like better mic placement or like better mixing things or even better just uh communication with the artists that you're working with as a free free artist and thinking about the longevity of what you're producing and me personally i've been on some record labels and you know i constantly send records to people to potentially be on other record labels but i made the sort of the you know, I would say Zappa inspired and also John Fahey inspired moment where I started my own record label. And so um, through that, I, I want to continually keep it a sort of effervescent thing where, where I'm recording things and putting out things and then also uh, producing other artists as well that could be on the record label, which um, is in the mix of happening right now, which I'm excited that it is um one of the first people is this person i was mentioning earlier uh domo branch who's an amazing artist who's going to record a solo album this this summer yeah um when i had machado on this podcast a couple weeks ago i was asking him about people that have had a big impact on the way that they operate as a musician or just like as a person and and he brought up you wow as somebody that's like (laughs) really changed the game for him Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and part of the one of the things he brought up was just uh your kind of approach in a lot of things of being able to like really go with the flow and like lean into Mm -hmm, things mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. maybe mentioning like even if a piece of your gear during a set isn't like working properly that opposed to like trying to fix that you kind of like lean into that and figure out how you can kind of make it work for you yeah i'm curious like where you feel like maybe you developed that mindset and uh that attitude towards things i think having the mindset and it, it will be very sort of eastern philosophy buddhist philosophy or uh anything that sort of curtails into um the ability to letting go of physical things um i will say that since i've done a lot of studies not never enough i would say in in that field i've done my bit of meditation and sort of uh loose sort of spiritual connection with with different things i'm not really uh i would say like specifically into one sort of sect of religion or philosophy for that matter. Um, kind of like to be open, but, um, in the physical musician standpoint of being there at gigs and being at recording sessions and knowing sort of the chaotic factors, be it the technical side of things or like the, uh, physical side of, of instruments and cables or this or that. And, knowing like stories from different people um just kind of expecting the worst at all times is kind of in the (laughs) back of my head um and also like as i learned from a great drummer bobby previtt who i've worked with and studied with um he told me that steve swallow who's a great um bassist you know um that's played with so many people he said once to yeah to him he was like expect the worst demand the worst and i'm like that's also going to stick with my head, you know, in, in a way, like it's like a Murphy's law kind of situation and to go back onto some other sort of, uh, you know, archetypes or you know, sayings that have been throughout the, the world and, and the history of the world, I will play guitar with just one string <laughs> and with the worst guitar yeah. and make it work like that, that mentality is in the back of my head almost at all times. And when, yes, there's like a, here, Michael, play this like fifteen thousand dollar Gibson that's at a studio, and don't break it or like don't <laughs> tune it in a weird way. Like you know, I'll respect that too, but at the same time, I'll I'll like 
you know, go down the street and listen to like a street musician playing a shitty guitar and be like, that's my jam right now. Like, yeah. I, I will listen to that just as much as, you know, the most high paid musician that's that's making records right now. Yeah. And respect it just as much. All about the feel over mm -hmm. maybe some of those other things. Yeah, absolutely. It it it's more it's more whole and wholesome and uh much of a a sort of detriment of of the way that the music industry has went like I don't know I feel like when we get back into our original form of being in tribes or being in caves or being in you know small like you know parties around fires in a cold place you know there's going to be some sort of sense of community that music brings and should never be away and then as soon as of course the sort of like uh like we're talking about collecting and ideas and rules or this that come into play there's a lot of problems that come come out of that and we know yeah. that living in america that we are it's like the more uh the more issues of laws being passed that are restricting us as humans to do what we naturally do are going to be really problematic for us in the future yeah <clears throat> yeah i would just imagine that's like a pretty big game changer as a creative and especially with the type of music that you seem to enjoy playing if you can like not see problems as barriers or yeah. hindrances and and more as like this portal to another place that you wouldn't yeah. normally get to if you had this piece of equipment break down in some way and yeah. maybe tapping into things that you would have never had the opportunity to explore otherwise yeah because it it makes you see your limitations in front of your face like when something goes wrong yeah. and it's like it's it's a such a great obstacle in a way like thinking about um anybody that's in track and field and how many how they'll learn how to deal with injuries or learn how to deal with like temperature changes you know yeah. um the same thing in the food world it's like you have to know like when something's gonna wilt you know right. when when you know you don't put enough water in something it's 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 gonna be dry or you know if you put too much oil into something, whatever it is, you know, there's these sort of things that you learn, these, these, uh, these general sort of, uh, um, like things that scientists and physicists and metaphysicists have been studying forever. Yeah. And it's good to take note of those, but it's also like I'm in, in the mode of like experiencing something as a part of your process, this sort of Dasein, uh, you know, Kant moment or something. It's like, or even like how Wittgenstein talks about how he experienced education and how that sort of flipped his mode by in it being able to teach and being able to like going from being a pessimist to an optimist. And yeah, there's so much it, around the world that we live in this whole sort of like, I'm a, it's almost like an Indian Hindu way of thinking about the world as a rigid egg and you're a part of it. And I really dig that in a way. So like everything that you do is a part of the grand scheme of things and everything you don't do is also a part of the yeah. scheme of things, you know, For and sure. realizing like, you know, that we all have problems as humans, like regardless of your experience of growing up or not, it's like, you know, there's certain things that I feel like really um, make more problems than actually help yeah <laughs> For sure. some of those are more obvious than others <laughs> mike i have to pee so bad i drank too much coffee and <laughs> uh, i need i have to do it before we wrap oh yeah absolutely <clears throat> or i'm gonna be distracted for the last for for the tail end of this thing for sure man for sure no i'm okay i'm just gonna um send noah bernstein a text right now
my god yeah best bagels best bagels people the... that are inspired in portland by yeah noah bernstein yeah heavy inspiration uh he was the first person that i met in portland that was a musician like i i uh through friends of friends got introduced to him yeah. and and i really did not know many people when i moved here and um just knowing by his game of 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 working with something that's so beautiful as like a really legitimate bagel and doing it out of his like you know biodiesel mercedes from the <laughs> 80s hand delivering them yeah to like the point where he's build up his business so much where um he has so many great employees and have so 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 many great like stories to tell it seems like he sells out of bagels almost every single day if, yeah if the, the weekends are almost guaranteed yeah. if you don't get there early it will sell out yeah and on top of it he's like one of the most phenomenal alto saxophone players that's done so much work with so many great artists um including tune yards and including father john misty and oh shit i didn't yeah. yeah i don't know too much about noah's like musical background like i've yeah. seen him play music once or twice and i know that he's a great player but i almost like know him more from my my buddy chris frank like just fucks with the bagels so hard <laughs> like he also plays music with noah but yeah. like i wait, wait is he in um the uh old unconsciousness Chris, chance, yeah. Uh, Chris has his own band called the Frank Irwin Quintet. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Now I know what you're talking about. Um, um, I apologize. So. Oh yeah, it's all good. <laughs> There's a lot of musicians in this town. A <laughs> <laughs> um, few things I want to touch on. Sure. As we wrap up, um, another thing Machado mentioned about you is, and obviously, like I can also see it in the way that you like to document things and mm -hmm. the amount of recording you do, but you love to listen back to the set. Yes. What he <laughs> said, you will like hound a sound person to get that that recording. Sure. At the well, end of the night, like, what is that? Um, what do you enjoy about that sort of practice, and what do you get out of it? That's important. Sure, sure. Um, and uh, I will say, like, big props to Machado too. I must say, but I'll I'll start by saying, like, that person is just as inspirational as I hope I am to him that he is to me. I mean, that person is, is paving the way in this city in so many great ways. And, yeah. and, um, much respect to him and his artistic prowess and also like his professional thing too is, and his way that he deals with social media is far beyond most people <laughs> that I know. <laughs> and I, I feel honestly so, so much out of the loop because I feel like, you know, our particular generation, we're kind of on the deciphering edge of, millennial towards gen x and like do we actually like <laughs> these things where i feel like machado is fully embraced in this way that that works and and he's developed his own personality but um but as far as recording and and um listening to uh to things that have happened like maybe like even a day or so ago it's a part of the process for me to hear like the mini school maybe mistakes that i've done or like maybe new territory that I reached and to synthesize that into what I could do in the future. So to some people, it might feel like the most narcissistic, self-indulgent thing to listen to yourself. But um, I sort of disagree in a lot of ways to, to that perspective because, I don't know, I feel like a couple great luminaries told me once um a couple of different things this person paul play who's a great pianist said record everything <laughs> like document everything why wouldn't you you know and i'm like yeah. you know what that's true and especially in the digital age if you have a hard drive yeah you know hard drive are cheaper than ever and you know you can digitally store something and to have that sort of documentation there when it's available um you know, why not do that? Now, what I say, like, listening to yourself, like, over and over again, same record, same thing. Yeah, that's a little self-indulgent. Yeah, that feels a lot different to me. Yeah, yeah. Listening to, like, an iPhone recording of a basically a gig that you did in a small club 
in Sacramento, California, like not, not that so much of a big deal. It's like, you're, you're listening to the tiny nuances of like how a bass player, like for example, we recorded, uh, or played two gigs with this great bass player, Lisa Mezzacapa in San Francisco and also, um, in Sacramento. And, uh, I actually haven't listened to that recording yet, but I want to, because I know in the future we're going to be working with this person and I want to hear how they approach not only my songs, but their own songs yeah. and also Machado's songs. Yeah. And, and to hear how that differentiates itself by playing maybe the same material aside of like Lisa's stuff with like Andrew Jones, the great bass player in, in Portland and also with Machado, like everybody, like I was saying at the beginning of this interview is like, there's, there's personality in every musician, as long as they're not a sine wave or an AI bot. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's really true. It's like, there's so much ways that people will play just one chord in a yeah. different way. Yeah. That makes sense. Like with the style of music you're playing to when there are so many like improvised moments mm -hmm. from set to set that maybe you do want to hear what was played, whether it was yourself or the other people in the room and like yeah, especially the, that the, constant rotation of so many different players that you're playing with. Yeah. And like the reaction that you might not hear on the bandstand of what another instrumentalist did or like, or just, you know, just blew over your head or something. Cause yeah. maybe you're like, shoot, I actually really have to cut this set off because I have to go take a leak or like, yeah, I have to go calm my mom. Yeah. Or I have to go, you know, boil these bagels in the morning or whatever you have to <laughs> yeah, do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't like think about it <clears throat> so much in that way as, you know, I'm obviously when I'm having these conversations with mm -hmm. you or anybody else that I'm always trying to be so in the moment of what is happening, but also trying to figure out where the thing is going next. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like, I would imagine that that's kind of like a part of playing jazz or like improvised music is like, you're being present, but you also have to like think about things dynamically. And so it's, it's often not like some things can sneak by me during these conversations and that I don't always hear until I'm listening back during the editing process of like, oh shit like they actually said something pretty brilliant there or, or like something i didn't catch that was funny mm -hmm. yeah a, a all and i have talked about that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because you know a all also has has a lot of like interview experience where so much sometimes yeah. you're trying to guide the conversation so much that you don't always catch everything so it is often the editing process where i'm getting to fully listen to yeah. what you had to say yeah yeah and i i really respect that of somebody like yourself who who likes the nuanced things and and it's not just like kind of binary in that sense where it's where it's like either this or that it's like you know it's, it's something that could develop even more so than it did in the moment by doing the editing process and that's that's what's great about technology these days is is you know, you have all the ingredients and you have all the tiny little um, bits of zeros and ones <laughs> yeah. that have happened and and you can really do something fun with them or just throw it away, you yeah. know, and, <laughs> and see what happens next. <laughs> yeah. Uh, at that Blue Butler show I went mm -hmm. to, you mentioned that you suffered a traumatic brain injury. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious when that happened in your life and... Yeah. Like how you feel like maybe that has impacted your your creative mind. It it did a lot of things. Uh one one thing that it did that I still think about is um it put a lot of sort of original um spiritual and philosophical um concepts like more it, it settled them more firmly into my soul and to my experience as a human um, because essentially death was was around the corner in a, in a way um, I I had you know a process where yeah I was in amnesia for like a, a week or so and I wasn't saying words correctly yeah my partner Devin Fabriello was really worried 
for a multitude of reasons that, you know, I wasn't going to come back full form. And, um, you know, I, I will have to give respect to all the people that helped out, brought food, um, and sort of helped me sort of get back into, into normal life. And, um, it was a process of like about a couple of weeks where I could really even like walk straight, where I could even speak right. And yeah. I started to play guitar and I recorded all these tracks on my iPhone and I released an album like that. And then I was at this big recording session um, that I was doing with Todd Sikafus and this great drummer, Matt Chamberlain, who's recorded with everyone from Fiona Apple to Bob Dylan and yada, yada, yada. Um, and sadly he had to bail from the session. It was like right during the Delta phase and was really kind of sketchy in a lot of ways. And, um, I ended up hiring some amazing musicians, Machado Majiga, we just mentioned, uh, and, uh, Matt Mayhall and another one of my, uh, friends and also people I look up to a lot, Mike Lockwood. Yeah. Um, and we recorded an album that's going to get released in the fall of like seven hours of improvised music of me basically coming back to life. So this all happened like pretty recently. This is 2021. That That's recent ask, I would say. Damn. Yeah. yeah. No, that's super recent. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it is 2024. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How did it yeah. happen? Um, it happens by just sadly, um, it was a mixture, of a lot of things. I also had a strange, sort of ear situation that happened um, okay. at a gig at the Alberta Street Pub. And I want to blame it on a fried fish sandwich that I ate. <laughs> um, it wasn't tuna. I'm sorry, but uh, it was probably cod or something. I don't even know. I mean, if you're going to blame it on it, I don't <laughs> want it to be the, on account of the tuna. <laughs> no, never, never tuna. <laughs> um, but um, what happened was, was I got some crazy like flu and that turned into like, me having to go to an emergency room and having a crazy flu. And then like I went to the, the ear doctor and they basically tested my hearing and I lost a certain frequency range, like a couple decibels in this range um, in just one year. And I had tinnitus in one year. I was like, I keep saying it's like the frequencies that I never liked in the first place. Um, <laughs> but I thought I had Meniere's disease. I thought I had like all this crazy sort of like uh, imbalance. And what happened was I had this non-cancerous tumor that was developing and that luckily, knock on wood, that it's gone f forever. At least the swelling has went down. Yeah. I've had many MRIs since then. But I lost a sense of balance and I had to take steroids to develop my ear. And um, that summer when I had the TBI was like when I was kind of finally first feeling really great. And then I just lost my balance carrying the trash down and coming back oh, up the shit. steep, steep, uh, staircase. And I fell backward. And so I know I keep like relating doing it. anything like, like extreme. No, or anything. it was just, just like, literally just lost my balance and crazy. fell backwards. And two things saved my life. One is the grill that I used every day that summer pretty much because my head hit the grill and then I hit the floor broke your um, fall a little bit and broke my fall a little bit and then also this gentleman who uh owns this amazing store called Cherry Sprout that's right by Mississippi Records he saved my life as in he noticed that he heard it and he came and like my wife and um a friend of theirs were just having some wine and just like enjoying themselves and like yo why is Mike like passed out is he hammered and i wasn't yeah was he stoned and i wasn't was he like you know like lack of you know uh food or lack of water which wasn't true it's just i just had a terrible fall yeah and so after that happened um you know i went to emergency room i got like you know sort of like ridiculed by the emergency team and you know it's it's just a big mess but luckily i feel mostly uh 100 percent back um there's times where I, i'm staring at a computer for too long or a sheet of music yeah and i go into sort of a warbly sense of understandment but i feel like for the most part i'm almost back <laughs> do, you, do you still have like some of that i don't know lo new lease on life kind of like yeah I mentality mean, like when it i would i would imagine for someone that like you who's constantly playing music it mm -hmm. must have been like 
tough to feel like I don't know if I'm ever going yeah to play it, like it was an extremely tough must be scary and it was really scary and um yeah I sort of crept back into it and and play a lot more improvised music and then started playing written music started writing stuff and and yeah I feel pretty much confident that I'm back yeah I think there's definitely some residual effects like when I talk to uh, other TBI uh, veterans of sorts, yeah, <laughs> like the, everyone has a different story and everybody has a different uh, effect. And they will, they have said like in the after I went through all the therapy, that musicians in general, since the way that they their brains do work, like heal better in certain ways. And mm. I think I was one of those cases. That is uh, inspiring to hear. I actually have a friend who recently experienced a traumatic brain injury and is also like a musician and i know that like there have been there's been like a lot of struggle there of just like figuring out like Mm -hmm. oh like gaining motor skills again to be able to play an instrument or being able to sing and and things like that so yeah um yeah it's inspiring to know that like you've been able to make what feels like a full recovery and yeah have that experience and i I don't wish it on anybody and if you know anybody out there in the world ever has an you know experience like that definitely hmu yeah you know for sure did you whatever, get like, <laughs> in whatever way did you get like speak. a you have like a tattoo of a grill on you now <laughs> <laughs> well honestly another thing that brought me back to life is bernstein bagels too because as soon as noah i heard noah was coming over i like literally came back to life maybe the glute brought me back <laughs> the spiritual glute that is uh bernstein pickles um tell me about what you feel like first off like what sparked you getting into teaching mm-hmm. and what do you feel like your like i'm sure from student to student it's it's very different mm-hmm. but like what do you feel like your approach to to teaching is and like what kind of like formed that foundation for you? Um, I would say I feel like I've always been teaching since I started playing guitar um, in small ways. Like friends were like, hey, I'll give you a pack of firecrackers if you show me how to play the <laughs> like, you know, mega death tune. Or yeah, the bartering system has been around forever in, in my head. And um, uh, now being like, you know, a professional teacher in academia, um, you know, there's different things you have to learn and different sort of, uh, uh, you know, experiences, you know, especially now with, with AI and being able to notice that a kid is essentially cheating with that, um, in like the hip hop history class that I have, or like the music production class that I have. Um, so there's that. And then, there's also like the idea of, um, you know, taking the Socratic approach and being able to learn from your students and be able to, to say that, yes, this is teaching, but it's also learning and it's also research and it's also, um, spiritual in that way of, of being in a room with some other person and being able to, to pass down things that you've learned and to learn new things from your student as well. Yeah. You feel like you had a lot of teachers along the way that treated you yeah. the same? No, definitely. Definitely from uh, anybody, like I was saying, John Abercrombie, Bob Moses, um, to uh, Bobby Previtt, to um, Cecil McBee, the great uh, bassist, Danilo Perez. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, even experiencing like uh, small amounts of education or hanging out with uh artists that are like my own age too i still learn from like uh my bandmates like noah jarrett who's in the band in betweens with me he's the son of the great pianist keith jarrett and um he really really still teaches me things with without even saying you know it's like sort of like a lot of unspoken things yeah Um, um do you find it just often to be like a lot of fuel for your own fire then because you yeah. are approaching it in this way of wanting to not just teach but but learn when you can absolutely i mean when i ended up getting my graduate degree at oregon state um i had the opportunity to 
to study with all these different people and it was an interdisciplinary degree. So I was sort of like put in this position where I had to choose three different advisors. And I specifically was like, no more dudes. <laughs> I'm not going to learn from any more dudes. Um, <laughs> Cause I have studied with the majority of like, of gentlemen who've taught me things. So I studied with the great composer and performer Dana Reason, who's studied with Pauline Alveros, um, who's studied with um, uh, so many great composers all, all over the place, um, and has experienced like the Mills College scene and the Southern California scene. And then I studied with this great uh, video artist and um, installation artist, Julia Bradshaw, and a great female filmmaker, Mila Zuhu is her name. Um, and I really got so much out of that uh, rather than just being like, okay, I'm going back to jazz school. Yeah. Let's learn the jazz changes, this or that. It's like, I was like, actually, I want to learn how to do experimental art yeah. and fuse it into um, my performances. And I want to learn how to do narrative film. I want to study music without a capital M and that's what I did with Dana Reason is, is diving deep into deep listening Pauline Alvarez approach or or uh George Lewis approach yeah um from Columbia University and uh the Braxton approach and sort of stuff that I was not skating over in any ways uh in my New York experience but I, I just you know didn't have the full-on experience of learning from somebody who's learned from those people. So yeah, I would imagine it's helpful having a partner in Devin too, be like having another creative influence in your life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my partner is, is just as much as an influence as anybody else in my professional career. She not only is a great musician, um, herself as, as a songwriter and a poet and a painter, but she's an incredible filmmaker and a credible producer and community member of Desert Island Productions, which is here in Portland, um, and really just uh, doesn't do things um, that they don't feel like they can take seriously or like at the same time doesn't want to commit themselves to a project that they don't feel is going to be helpful for uh, their own career. And yeah. I really respect that a lot. Yeah, man. Um, what do you feel like you're most excited about creatively? Like whether it's music or teaching or recording, right? Like at, in this current moment, mm -hmm. this part of your, your musical journey. <laughs> um, I will say, um, I'm really excited that certain groups that I've been a part of forever, that being in betweens, um, that being a duo project with Tony Falco, a great drummer called Captain's Log, um, and then a new groups that I've formed here in Portland, like Twans, um, with Andrew Jones and Mike Lockwood. Twans rips. Um, and thank you. Um, and uh, the duo project I have with Chato Majigo called Tuo, and then also a trio that I started called Damino with Daniel Rossi myself and Noah Simpson, like these particular groups are sort of uh, getting more experience and getting more sort of uh, uh, sort of like a fa foundation to continue to grow on. Um, so those things, I would say one thing that I'm excited about in my record label called As Is Records is uh, I feel like finally having the uh, sort of... Uh, uh, substantial sort of like le uh, catalog I should say of releases that I feel like I can finally take to the uh, publicity standpoint like I haven't really publicized any records yet because I wanted to kind of grow the record label to a point where it's like okay here's the history of it yeah from a ground groundwork standpoint um, to here it is to like you know working with you know the wire or Bandcamp or whatever jazz is downbeat yeah. i don't know some some other cool publications um so those things are exciting and then a couple of releases in the future that i'm excited about is one with Lori goldston the cello player 
Um, I have the record with Todd Sigavus and those great drummers. And also looking to, to expand back into working with more artists all over the place. Um, it's something that I'm looking forward to creatively. Um, and then also working on more films and working on um, as a soundtrack artist that uh, I've done in the past, but I want to spend more time seriously doing. Yeah. Well, I'm excited, Mike, that you and I got to jump on, no pun intended, the mics. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. No, I have, uh, pun, puns. I love the puns. I have, uh, I have just really enjoyed all of my interactions with you, you know? Like, yeah, I feel likewise. like over the past few months, I've gotten to, to talk with you in, in various situations. So mm -hmm. um, you're someone that I've been wanting to, to have on on the podcast for a while and, and I'm glad I got to do it with you after I've like been able to establish some sort of like relationship with mm -hmm. you already. Mm -hmm. Like, and just like I said, yeah, just it really enjoyed our conversations. I've really loved chopping it up with, uh, about tuna sandwiches yeah. with you. Yeah. I know you're yeah. like a, a big fan of the tuna sandwich I am, genre yeah. <laughs> yourself, is. you know, yeah, so is. that it's really inst specific <laughs> instantly makes me you know feel connected to you yeah anybody that's coming up to me for the first time and wants to talk to me about tuna boy you know <laughs> I, I, you're in <laughs> I, I love it i love it i love it and yeah i i wish you the best with with uh developing that too because it's like you know it, it is a thing and it's something that that is is quirky to some people but actually really to the point of like <laughs> like you know it is one real specific way to to uh to eat a sandwich that that you know to some people can bring back bad memories and some people can bring <laughs> back great memories and, absolutely and i love that and also um you know your connection with uh the color therapy world world with ryan oxford and isabel walker and faustina etc cetera, etc cetera. like yeah i'm really excited that that um relationship is growing and growing and and i'm really excited to, also, another thing I will say, like artistically, is to be a part of certain records that have been done in that studio and yeah. be a part of that studio. Um, and Orion Oxford's record that hopefully is going to be coming out, and Arjun Miranda's record that's going to be coming out. And uh, I've worked with a couple other artists there, including Fastida and including, um, uh, uh, I would say, like Holland Andrews, one of the first records i did there was singing background vocals for their project called like a villain yeah which is really exciting to see their progression as an artist too yeah that place is incredible and it's been yeah, yeah it's been it's been awesome i've gotten to spend so much time there this mm -hmm. last year or so and just like getting to watch ryan work firsthand has been been uh quite the treat yeah no so, indeed um Mike, I'll put all the links in the episode notes so people can cool. keep up with you. There's so much music to go check out from Mike Gamble and all of his various projects and all the stuff that uh, is going to be dropping soon. So uh, stay tuned for much more. And we oh. end every episode, Mike, with the guest saying the tagline for the show, which is it's a program and it means absolutely nothing. It's just the way that my grandfather says the word program. He says program. Okay. Uh, recently found out that he thinks that he says program, which is really great. Like he, and he, especially with his, his background in education, it's, it's incredible. So if we get the Mike Gamble, it's a program. We can properly sail this thing out. Okay, cool. Um, maybe I'll do three takes just in case. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Let's get a few options. Okay. It's a program. It's a program. <laughs> It's a program. We're going to keep them all, Mike. <laughs> okay, I think cool. we're going to keep them all. That's Mike Gamble, everybody. Um, cool. I want to play the episode out with uh, indis Indiscreet Structuralist okay. off of your uh, pretexting okay. EP. Cool. That's uh, like been a collection of tunes that I've been listening to a right. lot from right. you. I love that, awesome. that EP. Um, but like I said, tons of other music to check out. And uh, that's the Jelly Jams. And we will catch you on the flip side, Portland, yes. or wherever you are listening from. We did it, man. Cool. All cool. right. Thanks. Hell yeah.